Thank you so much for having me. As, uh, I'm Jonathan. I lead the economics team at, at Uber. I'm super excited to be here tonight. Um, on, a, on a somewhat somber note in my field, economics, uh, at roughly the same time as tech, thank you, has been struggling, to put it lightly, mightily with the fact that the cultures and institutions of the field have not been welcoming to everybody. Uh, and spaces like wisdom are critical to re-examining and changing those institutions. So I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Uh, so with no more ado, um, I'm gonna try to get you excited in some of the stuff that I think is super exciting about Uber and then more specifically uh, about how the combination of economics and data can, can, uh, can teach us new things. So this is uh, an old version, I apologize, of the driver app. When a driver wants to work on Uber's platform, he or she presses that magic button and then can work whenever he or she wants. Here's an example of a different kind of work where you have to be scheduled and nobody likes that. Uh, and then here's the case where like sometimes you just can't get a job and that's no fun. Uh, here's sometimes if you're on DoorDash, you can't dash for some reason. Um, and then Via is a ride sharing company that sometimes tells you, sorry, the better version of Via is not available to you, but you can do the other version, which isn't as good. Uh, that's just not how we do things. And one of the things that I really like to study is what are the implications of this pretty unusual fact that uh, drivers can work whenever they want, wherever they want. This is not normal. How do we study this? What, what, is, what can we learn from this in five minutes? And the good news is that if you're at all interested and unconvinced by what I tell you, there's an entire paper about this on, on the internet. Uh, it's publicly available. Um, and please send me your comments. <laughs> um, and someday some journal will accept it for publication. <laughs> We're on uh, the fourth one right now. Um, okay, so what's, what's odd about drivers being able to drive whenever they want uh, the downside of that, or the, the relic of that, is that we, we don't offer a time-based wage. So most people who work uh, as employees of companies are paid on an hourly basis. Drivers are paid when they have riders, and the availability of riders is the result of the complicated interaction between how many riders there are and how many drivers there are. So there's a market outcome that determines uh, how, how much drivers earn per hour. So you could think of it as this formula. And I'm going to tell you we have a very simple theory of how this all comes together, uh, which we're then going to test with data. And so this is kind of a good example of how um, economists typically think, both from a theoretical perspective, which I think is very important, as well as then from a data-driven perspective. Um, so this is the theory uh, of how wages work on Uber. It's that simple. This just means that basically the idea is drivers will not drive with Uber if their wage is too low because they have other options and they will drive if the wage is high and as a result the prediction of the theory is that the wage will equilibrate to what the labor market wants it to be which is a somewhat surprising and shocking claim given that it means that no matter what Uber does uh, it has no control over the hourly wage and that some people find that uh, very hard to believe, and some people think it's obvious, and now we're going to try to attack this with some data. So the first interesting fact is that while the, the wage does sort of change over time, it doesn't really have any trend, and this, I apologize, only goes out to 2015, but it's roughly true to, to present. Um, there's an updated version of that in the paper. Uh, going ridiculously quickly through this, what we do is we take advantage of the fact that we change prices pseudo randomly in a bunch of different places at a bunch of different times. And we're gonna to try to use that to get a sense of what happens to the marketplace uh, when, when we change prices. So some people think, well, if you raise the price of a ride, then drivers make more per ride, so they must make more per hour. And other people say, well, you raise the price, so you'll get fewer rides because riders won't want as many rides, and that'll hurt drivers. And our claim is it'll, perfectly balance out every time, which is an even stronger claim. Um, and so let's see what happens. So this is jumping straight into, into the answers that we estimate. Uh, the first thing that happens when you raise prices 
is you get less surge pricing, which kind of makes sense. The number of trips that drivers do per hour goes down. So this is kind of like what happens at, at an airport parking lot, uh, in, in, or sorry, an airport taxi lot. And, and at JFK airport, uh, taxi drivers know that trips are very likely to be long and remunerative, and so they queue for quite a while waiting for trips, and that's the force that pushes their hourly wage down to where the labor market kind of wants it to be. We see the same thing throughout the market. And then here's the, the really interesting thing. When you raise prices, there's a sudden pop in hourly earnings, but the market adjusts over time, and so we can use data to see that our simple model is wrong. It doesn't happen instantaneously, but it happens pretty fast. You know, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks later, uh, the market has accommodated all the shocks that we've put into it. And the hourly wage is roughly back to where it was. And if you look at that little blue line, it's actually a little bit lower than it used to be. And that amount roughly tracks the fact that drivers are, are sort of burning less fuel and, and uh, suffering fewer costs. Okay, so that is a, a lightning round on the kinds of technical projects that we get to work on. There's a whole Uber research website that I would encourage you to check out, and there's a filter for economics for my favorite uh, part of the website, which is the economics research, but there's also a bunch of other fascinating data science stuff on there. Um, and then I just wanted quickly to sort of walk you through how economics works at the company. Um, this is all of the different departments of the company, and we work with all of them, I'm pleased to say. In fact, perhaps somewhat strangely, um, economics works least closely, if anything, with our finance team. You might, that might be surprising, but I have a team that supports legal, and I, have, I work very closely with policy and comms and marketing. We do a lot of work uh, with product on how marketplace works. Um, the strategy level, and then ultimately we do some work with finance, but it's not the main uh, touch point for, for economics. This is my favorite way of describing how economics and data science can work in sort of a virtuous circle in, the, in our company and in general um, in any company. So my team writes a lot of academic papers, not, not so much for fun, but to illuminate issues that are really important to the company. Um, but if you start at the top, which is the way most companies think about data science. You use research and insights to think about what your, your customers want. Then you build to that. You, you delight your users with great products, and then you use data science to evaluate whether or not it worked. And if it did work, then you continue doing what you were doing. If it didn't work, you do something else. And then you stop. And what, what we've done here is we've had the, the minor, if obvious, insight that once you have this data science infrastructure for demonstrating what's good for your users, you might as well do some, like write it up into a paper and publish it so that the world can understand that you've quantified the value of what you've produced for your users. And then if you do that, because writing papers is really hard and there's a lot of insight that goes into summarizing your results, you may well generate some new insights which feed back into the into the circle, especially if like us, you work with brilliant academics at universities, who by the way, you don't have to pay if they get to write these papers. So they're basically free labor. Uh, and then they generate new product insights that feeds back into this virtuous circle. Um, I would like to see more companies doing this kind of thing, but it starts with uh, a commitment to publishing papers, not on things that the company doesn't care about, which a lot of companies are perfectly willing to do, but actually publishing papers on the stuff we do care about, uh, which is something I'm very proud to have been a part of at Uber, and I stand by all, all of our academic collaborations. Uh, I'd like to see more companies do that and sort of seed this, this uh, virtuous circle. That's all I've got for you, and again, thank you so much for coming.